The School of Cleveland Ballet is now accepting auditions for both their trainee and summer intensive programs. Their trainee program is open to male and female dancers ages 18 to 22 and offers opportunities to perform alongside Cleveland Ballet at their home in Playhouse Square and in productions during their regional tours across Northeast Ohio. Cleveland Ballet's home theater complex Playhouse Square is the largest performing arts complex outside of Lincoln Center. School of Cleveland Ballet's summer intensive program is open to dancers ages 8 through 22. The program runs for four weeks where dancers will participate in daily classes in ballet, point, conditioning, modern, jazz, character, Spanish dance, and more. As part of the program, there is housing, food, and transportation available, as well as workshops in nutrition, injury prevention, makeup, and more. Auditions for both programs are by video and do not include any audition fees. Audition by March 31st, 2022 for the trainee program and by March 16th, 2022 for the summer intensive. Visit clevelandballet.org for complete audition and program info or click the links in the description of this episode. Dimensions Dance Theater of Miami returns to the South Miami-Dade Cultural Arts Center's Lab Theater March 12th and 13th with another exciting salon program featuring an insider's glimpse at five works all in different stages of progress being prepared for premiere later this year. Their program spotlights the work of four cutting-edge neoclassical and contemporary choreographers with an insider's look at the process. This popular program of dance and discussion will be followed, as always, by an open-floor question-and-answer opportunity for the audience. VIP tickets include a post-show cocktail reception with the artists following the Saturday, March 12th performance. If you're in the Miami area, get your tickets now. For tickets and more information, visit DimensionsDanceMIA.com or click the link in the description of this episode. Before we get started with our episode, we wanted to remind you of a few ways that you can support and connect with the podcast. If you haven't already, don't forget to rate and review this podcast wherever you are listening. You don't even need to leave a review. You can just go in and give us a five-star review. It really helps us continue the podcast growth and is greatly appreciated. Also, don't forget to connect with us on social media, Instagram and Facebook at Conversations on Dance and Twitter at Convo on Dance. Sign up for our email list to receive an email notification each time we release a new episode. Click the link in the description of this episode to sign up now. Now, let's get into COD. I'm Rebecca King Ferraro. And I'm Michael Sean Breeden, and you're listening to Conversations on Dance. Today, we check in with Houston Ballet to hear about their upcoming performances of Stanton Welsh's Sylvia. We are joined by Houston Ballet Artistic Director Stanton Welsh and principal dancers who will be performing the leads in the ballet, Connor Walsh and Karina Gonzalez. We first spoke with Stanton Welsh on the podcast in 2018 in episode 98, had Connor on in 2019 in episode 158, and are welcoming Karina for the first time. Today we speak with this trio about what led them each to Houston Ballet, getting back on stage this season for the first time since the beginning of the pandemic, their work and process of creating Sylvia, and what audiences can expect from this original full-length production. Houston Ballet Sylvia is on stage March 10th through 20th, 2022 at the Brown Theater in Houston, Texas. For tickets and more information about Houston Ballet's 2021-2022 season, visit HoustonBallet.org or click the link in the description of this episode. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's, it's three of you. So we, we, we managed to coordinate and you're performing this weekend. So we're super grateful that you could all join us. Connor and Stanton, welcome back. And Karina, we're so happy to have you for the first time. Um, since we've got three of you on, um, we don't have all day to get go through your entire history like we normally like to do. But let's just get a little bit of background from each of you. I'm curious what, um, with the, all of your formidable talents, you really could have gone many different places in the dance world anywhere. What about Houston Ballet attracted you to this institution um, and why are you still there? So maybe we start with Connor. We'll go clockwise. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah, I was. I went to a lots of different summer programs when I was younger and lots of different schools. And um, when I arrived in Houston when I was about 15, it just it felt like a fit and it has ever since. Um, just the method of training, the personalities, um, 
And the, then working with a company, you know, a school that was connected to a company was something that I had never experienced. So that was really important to me. Um, and yes, and now moving into my adult life, it's really been the rep and the diversity of programming that we do and getting to be involved in um, so many new works like we're going to be talking about today um, and getting to work closely with a choreographer like Stanton um, and having that relationship develop over years. That's really kind of a special thing that I think not many dancers get to get to have. So right. that's uh, sort of why this has always been a great base. You know, it's great rep and um, yeah, that's kind of the thing. I'll let pass, pass the torch. <laughs> pass the baton. <laughs> How about you, Stanton? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's for me. I I think what drew me as a to come to audition as a director. Yes. Yeah. Um, it was a. Uh, it was this idea that I felt that choreography based companies are rare, yeah. and here in Houston Ballet, Ben Stevenson had created this place where making story ballets, full length story ballets, unusual ones, classical ones was kind of a part of, and there are so few companies that were doing that, or that were investing the time, keeping the dress rehearsals, making sure that the this sort of Eden for choreography and, and making a good product was always available. And I thought that that was important and important mm -hmm. enough to raise my hand for. Um, and, and that's what drew me here. It's a really unique environment, Houston. It, we have in all the arts, all this growth and talent and the artists can still afford to live in the city. They can be in the city. They can have families, uh, sort of more like New York, maybe in the 70s and the 80s, where it's very creative. You're surrounded by the creators in all the different mm -hmm. art forms. And I think that yeah. that's a very special thing. You know, hearing you talk about, um, you know, being an artistic director and a choreographer and having that be an important role of your directorship, I wonder what your thoughts are on, you know, while there are big companies that are changing over right now, do you feel like we're even moving further away from that model? Of course, like with New York City Ballet and Balanchine, that was an important part of their model. Do you think that that's maybe something that's kind of slipping away? Further away from storytelling? From having a choreographer directing the company and being an integral oh, part of, of that. I don't know. It always sort of comes and goes in, yeah. in waves, I think, in and depending on on where the choreographers are and and uh, I don't know if I would say it's going away. I just think it sort of changes and ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. Like wh where is the talent? Uh, who? Is, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Right. Yeah. Do you think that working in the studio as a choreographer with your dancers helps you understand them in a deeper way than if you just mm -hmm. came in, taught class, you know, saw them perform other people's work. Oh, definitely. Like, is that, that deepens <laughs> the relationship? Yeah. Uh, undoubtedly. And I mean, that was a, another reason of why to be a, a director of a company. It, it, it was for that longevity of connection and that you, you know, their weaknesses, you know, their strengths, you know, how to push them in a way and how you know them as people, they get cast, you know, their range as actors and you can watch that grow and you sort of make a chain of progression of creation that fits with, with mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that, that is, is very unique and lovely and, uh, and certainly makes the process more detailed. It's like returning to Sylvia now, it's so lovely to not be correcting technique or, or arms or timing. We're talking about characterization and, you know, mm -hmm. should right. be a little bit more like this. It feels very artistic, you know. Yeah. It's not that right. panic of a dress rehearsal of, oh, my God, do they understand that they've got to hold the bow? And right. Karina and <laughs> Connor were with me when we staged this in, in Sydney last. And that, and that was frantic. I mean, that was a very different experience yeah. right i'm gonna have to get into that i do i do want to note because this is a audio platform that when michael asked if you get to know the dancers better both connor and karina smiled and, and nodded it must be really nice for you guys to all be in the studio together so karina yeah. let's go to your kind of origin story coming to houston yes so i'm from caracas venezuela and i have the opportunity to head to state to tulsa valley so i was there for a couple of years and i have the chance to dance Stanton's work while I was there. Uh, I think the first one was Bruiser. And then I worked with Claudia Munoz. 
uh, and that's how kind of I was um, I did his first ballet. I, I was introduced to his movements, and um, but the second time was Maninas, who have become one of my favorite ballets actually. Um, and I had the opportunity to work with him directly and Louis Lester. And I really love I love how he uses women in his ballet. How strong we are. He he's not afraid of putting strong steps or even big jumps like like the boys. And I feel like at that age. <laughs> And so it was so interesting to keep learning and keep um, keep seeing other dancers. And, and like Connor said, I think Houston Valley has a fantastic rep. Uh, and and yes, yeah, so I, I was so interested to keep growing. So that's why I transitioned to, to Houston. And this is my first reason to go Yeah. Wow. Um, I want to dive into really quickly, just we're going to touch on it and then move on to happier subjects. But let's talk a little bit about your experiences um, with COVID. I just find it, you know, when we have an artistic director, particularly on the podcast, it's interesting to hear from their perspectives, what this time was like, and then we'll move to the dancers. Just We can just touch on it briefly. But Stanton, what was that like, that time like, especially in the initial phases when everything was shut down and then kind of how did you guys progress to move back to this glorious time of being able to dance back on stage altogether? Yeah, I was, that's a big question. <laughs> I know, I know. It can't be brief maybe with it. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. It, it makes you emotional. I don't feel like we're out of it, right? right. Like mm-hmm. we, we opened Jules last weekend. We have more performances this weekend. We go into Sylvia this is really when we've finally taken everything off and feel like we're at full throttle and driving really mm-hmm. at full force. The school is with us. The orchestra is with us. We've got good houses. Everything feels really energised. And even though mm-hmm. in Nutcracker we'd done that, we'd edited and removed things and we were um, safe, safer. Um, so what did it feel like? It felt we'd had an experience with Harvey with the flood where... Mm-hmm. Oh, Sure everything shut down and you're waiting into the ballet building and we're sitting around a desk going, okay. (laughs) Um, So we'd had that practice as a team of that kind of thing. So I felt like in the beginning we were actually quite organised. I think Mm. for me personally it's the mandates and everything that was so hard and emotional Mm -hmm. is hard to think and talk about. You know, I think Mm -hmm. all of us suffered through that in some way. Um, that was the most painful thing, certainly. Mm-hmm. Sure. Making yeah, those was- decisions and 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 doing what we felt was right. Right. Of right. Course. Connor and Karina, you're back on stage in Jules now. I'm presuming that you have roles to dance this weekend while you're rehearsing Sylvia. What is that like? Um, is that a little like whiplash, you know, going back and forth between you're back on stage, there's the joys of dancing this ballet, right. but that's quite different from immersing yourself in a full length where you'll be doing you know, a character. Um, what, what's that like going back and forth for you guys right now? Mm-hmm. Start with Connor. Uh, sure. Um, you know, in, in Houston, we have a really great schedule for performing and particularly as Stanton was referencing earlier for making new works that we have a lot of stage time, a lot of preparation time. Um, so we're usually only performing two reps at a time at max. Mm-hmm. Um, but as the schedule, as we're doing that, we do like we are on the stage with two different programs right now. So last night we had a dress rehearsal, Sylvia, and tonight a show of, of jewels. But you know, I, I always feel that we have sufficient rehearsal time in this company, which is really Mm -hmm. great. You're rarely going out on stage feeling unprepared. And, you know, I could moan about, you know, doing these two big nights of dance back to back, but I know a lot of other companies are, are trying to piece together a different ballet every night. So I I, I think actually we have a pretty luxurious schedule for the most part. The challenge for us a lot of the time is sometimes stylistically and that we do works from mm-hmm. bare feet to point shoes to jazz shoes to pretty much anything is the range of right. work. So right now going from Jules to Sylvia is not such a huge transition for us physically, but you know, sometimes you're going from a Christopher Bruce dance where you're barefoot and in, you know, the deepest squat you could be for most of the night. And then the next night you're going into Jules, like that's when your body is like <laughs> trying to be two different dancers at the same time. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the company's used to this schedule and it kind of feels good to be juggling all these things again and not I just bet. focusing on one show four months away. Yeah. You know, it's, right, it's, right, right. it's that adrenaline and that um, that waking up the next day and being like, okay, next ballet. Oh, yeah. That makes me feel like we're back. You know? <laughs> that, it's, that, it's a new level of um, 
pressure and excitement. It's, yeah. it's mm-hmm. good to feel again. How about you, Karina? What does it feel like to be back again on stage? Uh, yeah, well, for me, it's, um, Kobe, I have to say that it was a battle. Like, I loved it and I hated um, <laughs> it um, uh, as a mother, especially, just because I have mm. oh, sure. home all day. Uh, but yeah, like, physically, it was just a battle. Like, mm-hmm. it's very good to be at home trying to train and trying to uh, be focused with a little little one running around. And that was the hardest thing I have ever done. Uh, but being back is, is, is who we are, it's who I am. I wanna be on stage and having that audience at a full theater back again, it, it has been a blessing. Um, mm-hmm. right. To add about the, the rep right now, I feel like it, the difference with other uh, performances is because Sylvia, it's our third time doing it, Connor and I, especially. So oh, it nice. feels, it feels comfortable. It feels like um, we are ready to go. And and Jules, for me, is totally new. So uh, I think mm-hmm. I focused so much in this program, but now we kind of, kind it's not relaxed, but I feel like it's just uh, confidence. Go mm-hmm. through the performances right yeah. now. Let's talk right. about Jules just for a second, because by the time this airs, we'll be over, but it's always wonderful to talk about Jules and hear about your experiences with it. It's one of our favorites, of course, of all time. Is this the first time, um, Connor and Karina, that you guys have danced this, or has it been part of the rep before? This is my second time, okay. uh, maybe about 12 years ago. Or something. Oh, it's been, right. a, while. It's been a while, right. It has. <clears throat> um, the company danced, danced it, and I performed uh, Rubies and Diamonds that, that last time, and this time around, just just spending time with diamonds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. What a great thing to be uh, spending time with. <laughs> it's, a, it's a glorious companion, I tell you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Karina? Yeah, so Jules was my first ballet when I arrived to Houston. So nice. uh, I was so nervous. Uh, of course, I feel like all the eyes were on me. Um, but I, <laughs> I used to do a, a Emerald, the trio. Oh, and, nice. and, and I feel like I always stay with that little thing in there that I wanted to be to do rubies. So 12 years later, I'm doing it. And yes. I've been waiting for it for so long. And, and of course, I know how hard it is, especially I I don't consider myself a balancing dancer. Like it's so hard how fast uh, you have to move and, and so musical. And so I, I feel like it was a, a, a beautiful challenge that, that now we are performing. Oh, right. So good. So we are about a week out at recording time from Sylvia being on stage. Um, Stanton, let's talk about your process with the ballet. Um, you've, you are known to um, rework, you know, very obvious classics, but then also, you know, something, take a risk with something like Marie Antoinette or Madame Butterfly. What, what brought you to Sylvia? Why did you think that that was a ballet worth um, presenting for the Houston audiences and, and giving your voice to it? Sure. Um, I grew up with the music of Sylvia. Um, it, was Dalib's score. I, I was around classical ballet. My parents had dancers. My mother actually choreographed to Sylvia on a ballet school when I was about seven or eight. And she has photos and videos of me dancing around in nymphs costumes, thinking I was great at that point. And I remember the music completely. Uh, it really impacted me. And then I, I saw it over the years and I always loved the music and thought I want to do something, but I couldn't make the story work. And I, I felt like it was a little shallow and, mm-hmm. and I, I couldn't find that link. And then it wasn't until I think about three years prior to making it that when I switched to the Greek gods and, and put Eros in and found the story of Orion and Artemis and that sort of explained to me why Artemis treated Sylvia the way she does, it all kind of made sense and that and that. Yeah, and that was where it really went into high gear once mm-hmm. I divided into these three stories. Right. So you mentioned once you found these stories, what kind of research are you doing? What kind of, you know, exploration are you doing when you have an idea for a ballet, but it's not quite there yet and you want to really develop it more? Um, I like lots of documentaries, I think. I endlessly have podcasts on or, or <laughs> YouTube on playing and, and mythology is always something that I, I've been interested in and I had a, a, a vague idea of it Eros and Psyche story I've seen as ballets actually 
before. And uh, so I knew that story. Um, it was just, I was really bothered in the story of the ballet, the original ballet, when Artemis, uh, or in that version, who is it? I can't remember what the, the Roman character is. But she says to Sylvia, you know, you, you can't marry the shepherd. Why was she bitter? Why was she cold? And we needed to find a way of fleshing that story out and explaining what had happened to her that made her the way she was, which, uh, yeah. Right. So, but then when you're trying to find that origin story, um, how do you musically find that, that path? Like, you know, the, the Dalib yeah. score is what it is, but how did you kind of work that out? It's kind of like there'll be a trigger in the music with an acting moment. In Maria, it was very much the dressing of Marie at the border. I had this piece of music and I could see or feel what it felt like. It sounded like what she should feel, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. So then at the end of Sylvia, the ballet, there's a last piece of music, which isn't often in many versions of Sylvia as a ballet. Um, it's kind of like an ending. It's a, it's big, dramatic score piece. And uh, when I started listening to that with the idea of how Artemis would have felt losing Orion and then only, you know, never getting to tell him that she loves him and, and that sense of sadness in her, her whole life, that music sounded like that to me. Um, and that was that was it. That was the trigger. And then everything else sort of filtered from there, the shepherd and Sylvia, because of the ballet, sort of have their story. Mm -hmm. It was making sense of the other, the Eros character and the Artemis mm -hmm. character. Ah. Right. And now, was this ballet created on Houston Ballet? Or you mentioned, do you say Sydney? Um, well, it was on these guys. I mean, we made okay. it here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. It was a co-production with the Australian Ballet and Connor. Oh, okay. And guested. Oh, you guested. It. It. So cool. So. Up. Let's talk about that then a little bit. Um, Connor, tell us a little bit about what that experience was like first um, in the studio for the creation process and then going um, to Australian Ballet to get to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's always exciting for us to to make a new full length ballet because, you know, that's it's a big investment for the company. You know, it's going to it's going to be something that lives on for a while. So there's always a lot of enthusiasm and energy from the company um, putting that together. Um, and, you know, particularly as we were mentioning before, like working with Stanton over the years, I, you know, sometimes if you don't know a choreographer, you're coming into the studio quite nervous and you don't know their process. And I feel like sometimes you waste a lot of time not knowing how to even approach the process. And, and, and what's great about working with um, a choreographer director like you were asking about is you can come into the space confident about what you can contribute and how you can help. Um, and that's you know, that's always fun. And I would hope Stanton would feel the same way with the dancers that it's, I'm sure it's still nerve wracking having tried choreographing myself. Like you, it's still very challenging, but you know, that there is like a sense of comfort um, in, in familiarity in the, in the people in the space. So that's always fun. And this ballet has so many different layers. There was in the original process, because there's all these different characters, a lot of us were working separately. And then there's a lot of revealing moments like, oh, wow, look at your section. Oh, look at your <laughs> section, you know, <laughs> seeing what all of your colleagues have been up to and how it all comes together. Um, because many of us kind of live an individual path through the ballet. You know, we kind of have brief interactions. Um, but, you know, there's sort of three strong so stories that are sort mm -hmm. of uh, simultaneously happening. And so it was a it's a it was a fun piece to put together. Um, and then, you know, going into Australia, that was great because it's so fun to see how another company interprets a work that you've not only been a part of the creation, but just that you've danced, you know, every mm -hmm. company dances in their own way. Um, I will admit sometimes it was a little embarrassing to be like, oh, they're doing that because they saw me do that on the vid, do it like that on the video, you know, like you become a little hyper aware of what you do because they're learning <laughs> right. it from a video of you and it kind of makes you think it makes you second guess some of your things um but i think in a positive way it makes you reevaluate like um what's intentional what is not intentional really bringing out what you want in the movement um and australian valley is a, it's a fantastic company filled with just the loveliest people karina will tell you too they're just they're also sweet and so when we've been there they've been so welcoming um and it was a lot of fun. Karina and I do some really wacky, challenging potatoes in this version. So when, as soon as they got there, some of them were like, how the heck do you do this move? And, you're, you're, and you get to kind of share the little tips of 
of all the rehearsals process, which is great, you know, because um, sometimes there's so much trial and error in a process. And then once you figure it out, it's not so hard, you know, it's like, and it's like, right. it's like, Hey, you know, if you just spot your head right then, then it's, you know, works out effortlessly. Stanton, would you say that's like kind of a hallmark of your, of your choreography? You, you like to push how like, the, the limits of partnering. Like I, I know that when Justin Peck came to set um, something on you guys, I forget which ballet was, but he was just like, the men are so strong. And it's like, it's because of Stan's choreography. It's just because you have to, you got to meet the challenge. But, but what about that interests you? Like, what, what, why is that something that as a choreographer, you like to pay particular attention to? It's funny, isn't it? It's like a lineage of ballet. So the Australian ballet always had a history of really wonderful partnering men. So there were principal men and there were the great dancers, the classicists, but there was also this whole contingent of matinee idol people who became super famous so when I started making full-length ballets in Australia, that was always a part of it. They, they meant you had this collection of guys that really loved partnering and challenged each other on it, you know, doing the 100 push-ups quickly after the bar before <laughs> centre. And it was that sort of energy of lifting. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, Ben's partnering is super hard. It right. is mm. super hard. Like it's also here was uh, Kenneth McMillan was resident choreographer. Mm-hmm. Um super hard partnering, Cranko's work, John Newmeyer. So we sort of had a, a history of that. And I feel like, yes, I definitely love that. And mm-hmm. I like working in that world because I do think it's so expressive. And I think mm-hmm. what Connor was saying too about the relationship between the choreographer and the dancer, it's also between people that are familiar. They, we just made Romeo and Juliet, the three of us. They were just Juliet and Romeo together in the production before so it's kind of like mgm studios where you've got mm-hmm. these movie stars that you keep finding projects for that their their relationship develops also and they become braver braver with each other and there's uh-huh. something that we tried before that didn't work that now works because karina's worked out a way or connor's got this right and the ballets escalate off each other you can see the connection yeah. Right. It's funny that you that we're talking about partnering. I was watching um, a video of you guys talking about Sylvia and Connor, you mentioned that's um, that Karina as Sylvia will partner you in moments because, you know, as a hallmark of she's a strong woman. So um, Stanton, why was that kind of important to throw that element in there, too? And is it as challenging as what the boys do? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was it was all the way through it. So it was, I remember one moment where I really felt awkward and I kept not being able to do it. And I wanted her to offer her hand and the guy to take it that way. Remember when you stand up in the act two and it just felt so unnatural as a man to be putting your hand on top and ballet. We're always programmed to be the way we hold hands. And uh, so we tried to do in everything, not just actually lifting and moving, but how you indicate how, who's, who's walking the other one, who is, how do you kiss? How do you romance? And uh, right through to the bows that both the men and the women receive flowers. It's very, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mixed that way deliberately. Right. But it, it's right through. It's every gesture we tried to make mm. that way. Mm-hmm. Karina, you uh, mentioned. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, right, no, no. Right. no, you I'll go ahead. It. I'm going to remember okay. it. You no, I, I wanted to ask um, Karina, because we start with Karina. Um, You've, you've obviously done a lot of other full lengths. How does your process for something, how does your process for each one differ? Or do you kind of start at a base, a similar base when, when you're creating your character? Uh, so I, I think the difference when, when a, you're doing a new creation is mm-hmm. when um, you have no idea what you want to express or who you are as right. a character. So especially with Stanjo's work, he I have the opportunity to do Julia as a mm-hmm. first first time and and this one with Sylvia he starts the process with a big book <laughs> explaining each character and I'm right, I mean I think that's amazing just because you kind of start the rehearsal with an idea of what he wants to express with a character uh, so yeah so Sylvia you have a long um, page explaining who she is how she, where she comes from and, and his idea um, mm-hmm. And then, especially Sylvia, I was a little surprised of the process, just because I think I was kind of um, used to all the other versions. Like, mm-hmm. I, I was expecting a classical, I was expecting a tutu, I was expecting mm-hmm. 
of some coin and a really difficult issue. And so when we started the process, I think our first rehearsal was our first meeting, the shaper and, mm -hmm. and Sylvia. And and yeah, it was completely the opposite. He he likes um he likes her to be funny to when we're talking about uh, about Sylvia is the one making him um I guess partnering him and uh, mm -hmm. any other ballet like the, the man is always in charge. This mm -hmm. one is the opposite. She's in charge in, in, in the part it is. And um and yeah some moments were super difficult. Like there are moments and I have to like totally grab him and he his arms are in the air and I'm holding myself um strongly and uh so it's just super fun but as we were talking about i think stanton has that um i think that thing then he can see if something goes wrong but kind of make it happen he you know he makes us do it over and over again until we, we realize what, what it works why it doesn't work right, uh, right and i think also as a partnership so i think we have i have to say then working with um connor and and creating things is it's super fun just because he makes you feel so comfortable and, and you can just go for anything and you know he's going to catch you. So I think mm -hmm. it's kind of use that to uh, how comfortable we are with each other. Yeah. Talking about the character development and also mentioning Romeo and Juliet for, for both of you, um, I wonder... I mean, I haven't had this experience, but when you are learning something like Juliet, you know exactly who you're supposed to be, right? You're learning the steps are new, but like the character is always there, like in your mind. And I wonder how that differs as you're, because with this, maybe you're discovering the character much further down the road once you already are know all the steps and then you can kind of start. So do, do you find that it's easier to go in with a clear photo, like a clear picture of who you're supposed to be? Or do you find that it's kind of fun to experience it through the steps? Maybe for both of you, Connor. Sure. Uh, I'd say both. I mean, uh, both present challenges that, you know, I enjoy. And sometimes like, for example, with Marie Antoinette, the first rehearsal was in an office. We were like in a conference room, I think. And Stanton was just showing us like a slideshow of different pictures. We were looking, we were all, each character was given their own individual binder and you did your own research. Wow. Um, yeah, it was tons of paper. It was tons of things for us to read through. So, and there wasn't another ballet for us to look for. So you felt walking into the studio, like to look at it for a reference. So you mm -hmm. were coming into the studio with your own kind of ideas and just opened to anything that Stanton would throw out your way. Romeo and Juliet, we had more of a, a reference point, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it doesn't, it's very different. It's very unique in its own way, but it's more familiar in its standard presentation of Romeo and Juliet as a ballet. Um, the story is told slightly differently, but a little more familiar physically as far as us approaching our characters. With Sylvia, I would say that was challenging in a way because there were all these different versions out there. So you kind of have like, is it this or is it going to be like that or is it going right. to be this? So it is a little hard to shed some of those things. Like Karina said, um, finding that physicality when you have a preconceived idea of what it may or may not be. Um, and again, it, and this one is more similar to Marie in the sense that we found our our own route. It's it, it you know our characters are very different um, than any other production out there. Um, so I found actually this one was sort of challenging because we did have all of our references and ideas, but then we had all these other ballets to kind of maybe pollute our imagination of what we, uh -huh. what we could or couldn't <clears throat> or should or shouldn't be doing with it. Um, yeah. But I think it, you know, you'll see it right away that it has a very unique physicality and all the characters have a very unique um, approach to this ballet. It seems right. like you were able to put some of your personality in it too, as since Australian ballet dancers kind of impersonated you a little bit by accident once you realize that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's a lot of Stanton putting our personalities into yeah. it, but that's, mm -hmm. you know, without us knowing as it's happening, right. we're all too focused. Right. And then in hindsight, you're like, oh, I, oh you know, <laughs> that's us being cheeky or that's us, you know, <laughs> being playful. And, you know, that, that, that it takes a little space from the ballet to see it, I think. Yeah. Right. So I have a question for Stanton. Um, something like Sylvia, while well known, it's, uh, people aren't as attached to it as something like uh, Romeo and Juliet, right? So uh, did you find, do you ever find when you're mounting something like that, like a Romeo and Juliet or like, you know, a Tchaikovsky classic, um, is it harder then to get your idea across? Like maybe someone's, what if Juliet 
the, your Juliet thinks it's, well, I want to do it like Olivia Hussey and Zeffirelli's. And you're like, no, I want it like Judy Dench, <laughs> you know, like a hundred percent. And that, and that is why being in a, in a group where they're all there for the vision, you know? So we, we go into Romeo and in our version, uh, it's a little bit more like the play. So Benvolio, for example, is quite a different sort of character than in a lot of the ballet versions. Right. And, and that's just how we go. Like we approach the material with this is the subject as opposed to I'm, I'm starring in Giselle and the organisation is supporting me as beautiful furniture as I do my interpretation of Eric Broon, you know, like right. it, 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 it's more focused than that. And then that, that way from the corps de ballet through the soloist to the principals, the energy and where everyone is, is all, is all there. And I think it really connects to the audience in a way. Um, you know, I, I think that that you certainly have preconceived ideas. I thought more ironically with Swan Lake than most things. Mm-hmm. Swan Lake has a lot, people really create what they <laughs> and and it is very individual to each body type swan lake right. and each individual person i think it's quite but romeo i think you know i mean they they can answer <laughs> <laughs> they have done the other one i think Trini, you did ben's romeo juliet didn't you yeah yeah i have to say that um, I think personally what happens is that you have seen so many other versions and dancers and so you have this stereotype in your head like how right. I should look or how I should move or, or, or what I want to portray so um, I think when when it starts, uh, it started from Juliet, I think yeah we knew the story I know who she is but he allows, allows you to be you so and then I feel the entire time even with Sylvia and um, he gives you the space to uh, to be you, to do what you feel it is right. Uh, or you come out from the lift, like what, what would you write? You know, what would be your reaction? And so he, I think that's what is beautiful to have a ballet created on you, mm-hmm. and you know, seeing hundreds and millions of videos and, and comparing yourself with others. So um, right. I think it, it's a, one of the most beautiful moments for when you come. Yeah. Stanton, I wonder what makes uh, the partnership of these two beautiful dancers something that inspires you and wants you to create more ballets on them. Uh, I think they challenge each other. I think that there's a challenge to it. And uh, <laughs> it's funny what Connor said about you. You can see yourself in the work. I see myself in the work, too. And you you get past the ballet and you look at it. But the, their relationship in Sylvia, I think, is, is probably the closest to what I think they are in real life, that Connor is, is broad and, and dreamy and, and full of, and, and Karina w- wants to make sure that it's all ready and have everything. <laughs> and then together that chemistry works so well together. I always feel like that they feed off each other. The acting looks very authentic. And if something goes astray they you don't notice they are read with each other's eyes and they know what's going on (laughs) and they can put each other down or or move each other how they need to right Uh, i'm curious for karina and connor what was the first ballet you danced together and can you tell me a little bit about your um your the journey of your partnership like how long how long have you two been dancing together do you remember the first thing we danced karina i can't recall i think it was one on one no okay Oh my gosh, that's a yeah. major part of it to start with. That's yeah. one and one by Yorma Ilo, which in the second movement is like a 10 minute part of it that is still is just a, 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 a marathon. Even when I think about it, I start sweating. It haunts um, your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> just one, of the, one of those where it just, is, you know, keeps going, keeps going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's been, I, I, you know, I feel like Karina and I now, I feel like I've danced almost everything that I've gotten to dance with Karina at some point even though that's probably not true, but we've worked so much together that it feels, mm-hmm. um, it feels like we've crossed so many um, bridges or journey, gone on so many rides together. Uh, there's just a, it, we have a great rapport in the studio in the sense that I think Stanton's right that we challenge each other, but it's that we both are never kind of settle. If something is not right, we always want to make it better. And we enjoy that. We enjoy mm-hmm. that relentless, you know, process of trying to improve on it trying to make that lift a little bit smoother trying to make it a little less 
you know, uncomfortable. Um, so even revisiting Sylvia for the third time, you know, we're still nitpicking at it. We're still trying to, you know, we still haven't gotten this the way we want it to be. Um, and that we can do that and problem solve together is, is a real joy. And then there's of course the chemistry on the stage. It just feels, it feels great. It feels authentic. Um, you know, we're, we match each other's energy on the stage in the sense that we're both willing to go to the same place together. Um, you know, whether that's in the romantic ballets or the playful ballets or an abstract ballet, like one on one, like Karina was saying, where we just challenge each other physically or we challenge each other emotionally. Um, that's absolutely, I'd say it's an accurate description. Sounds like you guys are perfectionists. <laughs> well, we, we do have to wind down because you are literally performing tonight. Um, <laughs> but before we go, I wanted to ask um, if there is a dream collaboration between the three of you. And this is fun because I'm letting you put the boss on the spot. Cast me in this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's my fault. We can blame me, Stanton. I but... think work or a new work. Let them pick a new work. Uh, right. I mean, maybe a new, a new full length. Yeah, that maybe you've had percolating in your mind. There you go. What's a new What's a new full length that we have yet to do? That uh, a new full length. I mean, it could be anything. Done. You could You could be doing. I don't know. Even I the Tinder Swindler. One, for all I we know, it's it already. <laughs> what is it? Tell us. Well, it's your job. Carmen, Karina, Carmen. <laughs> Carmen. 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 Oh, for Karina. Yes. Oh, of course. Yeah. Okay. We, that we, right. great ballet score and uh, great such a good score. A bit score. of a problematic story, but it, it needs uh, some You could change the story if you'd like. Absolutely. You, change you can do yeah. whatever you want. Uh, I have to say, I did, I did two different versions of Carmen in my career, and it's one of the, and I actually remember when the run was over, I would still listen to my Maria Callas recording after yeah. it was done. The only time you do something, you know, normally you like Nutcracker ends, you're like, please never play that again. Even that's I a know, great you know. score, but yeah. But I was like, I just kind of want to keep listening to Carmen. So <laughs> <laughs> it is Good wonderful name. music. That's true. Yeah. Well, we I mean, wish- there are more new Maya ones, guys. No, <laughs> uh, I mean, there's tons of ballads we want to do. I was trying to, I was like, try, over here trying to think of the, what, what should we pitch? What should we pitch that? Well, Nijinsky. yeah, dream, you know, of new Myers, absolutely dream roll, dream roll. But yeah, I, I, you know, Stanton did such a wonderful job with Madame Butterfly, that conversion of an opera to a ballet. So whenever I'm going to an opera, I'm always like, really trying to listen to that orchestration and being like is there a ballet tucked in there you know like is right. there or you know or do you keep the the, vo- the vocals um you know not you know i was just at magic flute the other day and i was like this story is such a could be a great ballet but i you know i don't know enough about um reorchestrating things if that's a, it's a good ballet but i always feel like there's um great operas that could be transferred into to new ballets yeah mm-hmm. yeah well, thank you guys so, so much for taking the time out to share this with us. We wish we could be there to see you, your beautiful dancing, but we will, you know, be watching your videos on Instagram. I already was peeking at some of them earlier. Um, so we miss, wish you guys lots of merds and we th- hope that it all goes really well. Thank you so much for joining us. And a happy rest of your season. May, Absolutely. may COVID not disrupt anything ever again. Thank Fingers you so much. Fingers are crossed. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all.